This is Pat Kehoe from the Island Artist Gallery. And I want to welcome everybody to this Zoom talk that we're doing in conjunction with the City Public Library. And I'm going to turn the screen over to Max. Michael. Island Artist Gallery. Oops. Okay, I'm going to close out here and let Maite take it away. All right. With library. Turn this over to that. Okay. Hello, everybody. Gonna... Thank you for being here. Um, my name is Maite. I am the Youth Services Librarian at Sika Public Library. And today we are in partnership with the um, Island Artist Gallery. Um, as you may know, uh, Sika Public Li Library has uh, been selected to participate in a NASA project called NASA at my library. So we are receiving training resources and opportunities to bring to our communities programs like this one. Today, uh, we are gonna bring to you uh, a program uh, to connect art and space and also um, also uh, we are gonna be sharing with you fascinating uh, information about NASA's latest uh, uh, technology telescope that is called James Webb Space. And um, we are going to, uh, the, the program is, is designed, so uh, we have two guests. We have uh, an artist, Lisa Tias Conaway, who is gonna be offering to you the masterclass to do art. And then we have a, a wonderful teacher, Jessica Christianson, who is going to be the one sharing with you the information about the James Webb telescope. So uh, while we are uh, uh, either working on the art or listening to uh, the information that Jessica has to share with us, if you have any questions, please do type them in the chat box and then I will be reading them aloud to make things a little bit easier for our guests. So Lisa and Jessica, if you are ready, I am ready too. Okay, I'm unmuted. Can you hear me now? <laughs> okay, wonderful. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and get us all started on working on our pieces and then we'll switch over to Jessica to do the presentation and then switch back to me near the end to um, talk more about art and finishing up some pieces and getting into the watercolor. So we're gonna go ahead and get started on drawing first. Um, if anybody signed up for the presentation with the museum, or I'm sorry, the um, library, you should have gotten a little packet. And in your packet is this really basic drawing step-by-step -step thing. Um, and it's just got some real basics on getting started with um, pen and ink. But I also sent out an email with a, um, with a photo of um, the, I think it's Phoebe, Phoebe, I'm not really sure how to pronounce it exactly, but it's the moon around Mars. And we have this amazing photograph and I'm gonna be basing my drawing off of that today. And that got sent out, it's on Facebook and it's also on the email that got sent out. So if you have that, that's what we're going, I'm going to be working off of and you guys can work off of as well. So this is a really basic concept of the piece. And this all around it is going to be black. Um, I'm gonna really quickly try and see if I can screen share a photo of that. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to. I'm not seeing my buttons. There it is. Um, share. So this is the photo that we're going to be working off of. Um, I don't know if you guys can do a really quick screenshot of that or something to try and capture that, but that's what we're working off of. So you can see all the blackness around it and then the really highlighted definition of the craters and everything. So that's what I really wanna look at and explore today. Um, and then going back to this. Uh oh, okay. So we're back to this. So just to do a step-by-step -step 
I did a really light pencil drawing of the overall image and did some rough little sketches of the craters in there. And then I switched over to just a Sharpie, but whatever kind of ink pen you have, I've used dip pens, all kinds of different stuff in the past. Um, I've switched over to that and I'm putting in little line textures. And then after this, this is what I'll be working on throughout the presentation that Jessica does. And after this, I will be switching to watercolors to fill in and make it really kind of fun and interesting at that point. So while we're working on this, um, we'll be listening to Jessica's presentation. But going back to this really quick again, um, I'm doing a lot of contour hatching for this piece. So a lot of curved lines and a lot of stippling as well. Those are my two go-tos. So those are what I, I like to work with the most, but do whatever you like, whatever's bringing texture to your piece and really pay attention to your darks next to your whites and, and how to create that definition because the more contrast right next to each other like that, the more interesting your piece is gonna be at the end. So with all of that, I'm gonna go ahead and get started on this and um, we can switch over to Jessica and learn all about the telescope that way. So I will go ahead and mute myself and let Jessica take over. Okay. Welcome. Um, I am probably going to need the host capacity or screen sharing disabled for my part. <laughs> and while that's getting set up, I just I, I am so excited um, about the presentation tonight. Um, my position in the school district is I work supporting teachers and students on integrating arts um, and culture and technology with other subject areas. And I, in researching the James Webb Space Telescope and in preparations for tonight, I just um, am so struck by how beautiful um, and explicit that integration and, and marrying of visual arts and, and um, collaborative construction and um, science content is for tonight. And I just think it's, it's a perfect opportunity. So I appreciate being invited to be here. Okay, so I am going to um, share my screen. If um, I'm gonna start us off with just a kind of a, a brief introduction video to the James Webb Telescope to kind of give us all a base level of understanding. Um, so if, if it's not working, uh, please uh, unmute and speak up um, so that I'll know that um, we might need to adjust, okay? Okay. This. Sorry, everyone, thank you for your patience. I'm trying to get this, there we go, the sound to go share sound okay is your telescope an engineering marvel an exploration powerhouse use it to look back in time and explore the first galaxies that formed after the big bang to peer into atmospheres of planets orbiting the stars it's your eyepiece to the uncharted unknown and unimagined This is the largest, most complex, and challenging space telescope ever constructed. It will change our understanding of the universe and our place in it. The James Webb Space Telescope. Equipped with the largest primary mirror ever to be flown in space at six and a half meters, it's more than six times the size of a Hubble Space Telescope primary mirror. Webb's four cutting edge infrared instruments and cameras operate at super cold temperatures. Temperatures colder than the surface of Pluto. Getting this cold 
is done with the help of the largest sunshield ever flown. A five layer, tennis court sized sunshield that blocks heat from the sun, earth, and moon. Webb will be the first telescope to detect light from the most distant galaxies in the universe. These first galaxies formed about 13 and a half billion years ago, only 300 or so million years after the Big Bang. Webb carries advanced technologies to tackle some of the most fundamental questions about the universe. How did the first galaxies form and evolve? Are there chemical signatures of the building blocks of life on other worlds? Is our solar system unique? Launching such a large telescope into space is an incredible engineering challenge. Fully deployed, Webb is too large to fit inside any rocket fairing. Engineers designed it to be folded, like origami, to squeeze inside the European Space Agency's five meter diameter Ariane 5 rocket fairing. After launch, controllers on the ground deploy Webb remotely. Deployment is an intricate ballet. For nearly three weeks, controllers carefully unfold Webb. After this delicate dance, Webb's golden mirrors are precisely aligned using motors behind each hexagonal mirror segment, adjusting them to form one perfect mirror. Once the instruments are fully cooled, the exploration will begin. Webb is a technological challenge like no other, born of the efforts of thousands of people across the United States, Canada, and Europe. The James Webb Space Telescope is your telescope. Use it to explore, to challenge theories, to see sights yet unseen. It's yours to unfold the beauty and mystery in the universe and our place in it. So I, I just love that video. I think it's a great introduction for some of the big concepts of why um, this telescope, I mean, it's, it's just revolutionary and why it's, it's in the headlines a lot um, as we're in the launch window and as um, it was originally hoped to be launched. Well, there's several original launch dates, but recently the thought was it would be launched today. And then, um, you know, as they're doing some final testing, they, they are the current um, anticipated launch is December 24th, Christmas Eve, actually, um, about 3.30 in the morning, our time, 3.20. Um, and so fingers crossed, uh, everything will continue to uh, be seen as A-OK -okay and, and this will be launched. Um, so there's all kinds of wonderful resources like this video. Um, I'm going to be basing my um, story map that is actually available from National Geographic Education. If you are wanting to um, dive into some resources, um, gosh, there's many of them, but National Geographic has got some wonderful things. Um, so yeah, the James Webb Space Telescope, um, the largest telescope that has been constructed um, that has been in process for 25 years of the making. Um, $10 billion was at risk a couple of times of not happening, uh, was almost canceled in 2011 um, and is set to go up and is a joint project between NASA, the European Space Agency and the Canadian Space Agency. Um, and a lot of the conversation about the James Webb Telescope um, really centers on its comparison to Hubble, um, which just turned 31 years old, and just how um, one of the images from Hubble um, have been. Um, and, and so in this comparison, you can see the James Webb Telescope and the Hubble, a model of the Hubble to the right, and then a little image of a person keeps showing up. The telescope is substantially more primary mirror, this uh, hexagon um, 
golden mirror that uh, we'll be getting into a little bit later. Um, and the one of the things that has everyone, I think, so excited is the um, strength and the innovation with the instruments um, and what the hope is that it will unveil about mysteries of the universe um, and things really previously far out of um, reach. So just to kind of ground it a little bit. So Hubble, um, like I said, is 31 years old. And so it, I mean, just opened up all kinds of amazing images. Um, I love this graphic because it shows a lot of those things. Um, Hubble really focused on images with um, ultraviolet light, visible light, and just a little bit of infrared. And that's where we get these beautiful, like the um, nebulas and the gas clouds that have been apparent. There we go. And a lot of the discussion with James Webb Telescope and Hubble is that um, it's not a reboot. It's almost like a successor and a next stage in the evolution. Um, this image one is interesting because this is not to scale, but in this one, you can see here's the Earth and Hubble um, orbits and has been orbiting about 340 miles up above the Earth. And that's why when um, there were some mechanical issues in the early 90s, you know, they were able to be fixed uh, because Hubble could be, you know, reached. Where now we are talking about a telescope that is going 1.5 away, so far away. And, um, you know, that is why they're testing and making sure everything is working because it cannot be reached so easily with a wrench. So I talked about the the interesting thing with the mirrors, and and I think that's this is a part I want to focus on tonight because the idea of these hexagon mirrors um, is an image that uh, you see over and over a lot in the um, artwork and the art mm, challenges, for lack of a better word, that uh, NASA is encouraging people with the James Webb uh, telescope. Um, the mirror is just really fascinating. I mean, it's six times larger than the Hubble primary mirror. Um, the entire James Webb telescope is three stories high. I mean, it's just massive. Um, and yet, it's been really engineered to fold up, to fold and unfold. And that is what everyone will be watching with bated breath to see how the unfolding works as it is launched and traveling for the first 30 days. Um, with, okay. Um, so here is a, a rendering of what the, uh, the James Webb telescope will look like. And that giant, golden mirror is actually 18 um, different mirrors that will be put together, unfold, fit together, and act as one. One thing I thought was very uh, interesting was uh, the mirrors are actually uh, manufactured by ball aeronautics, such as ball canning jars, um, and that they have a history of working with the big telescope observatories um, and in their aer aeronautics division. And uh, there's actually an interesting book called From Jars to Stars. Maybe it's available at the library, but that talks about um, the rise of ball uh, aeronautics. From So when you're canning this, as you're canning this next summer, you might think about that. <laughs> so the way that the telescope's gonna work is um, it's really gonna be focused on infrared. Um, things that are not visible to uh, the human eye and things that are um, very uh, low frequency wavelengths. And so when there is an object, a star, millions and millions and millions um, of miles away, the light waves will be coming and will basically this primary mirror, this, this 18 pieces unified together will act like a giant bucket and just capture all these waves that are coming over. Um, and by 
capturing everything within the big bucket, then it'll bounce off of the primary mirror and head to a secondary mirror that's a lot smaller. If this secondary mirror was the first one that was out there trying to catch everything, you could see it would, it would miss a lot. So that big bucket of the primary mirror captures things that are just very, very distant and very difficult to see. And will be pointed at maybe an area for hundreds of hours, just capturing, capturing, capturing. Um, so the big bucket will point the light over to the second mirror. And then the second mirror is actually gonna send, bounce the light inside. And inside there is a third mirror. And this is thought of as a three mirror telescope deep inside. And they call it a three mirror telescope, but actually there is a little fourth one in here. And it, that acts like an image stabilizer because of um, shifting just to kind of stabilize the image. And then it comes back into where there's a camera. And that's what will capture the images. Um, yeah. Um, and so another really interesting thing about all of this, um, if any of you have really um, put telescopes outside, you know that you've got to do some things with temperature stabilization and getting them you know, used to being out there. Um, these things have to stay extremely, extremely cold. The optic system needs to stay very cold. The mirror side always needs to stay cold. Um, and, and if not, then you'd have to plan for temperature fluctuation. And that's another spot where the Webb telescope, the engineering team has been just really remarkable. This, oop, let me get to my pen. Sunshield is basically going to guarantee that in the dark and always cold. So they aren't blinded by any light coming from the sun or the earth, and they aren't um, uh, impacted by any heat coming from the sun or from the earth. Um, the goal is for this area to stay negative 370 degrees Fahrenheit. They have to be, this, the optics and the special instruments have to be so, so, so cold. And so this amazing sun shield will be folded out and deployed. And it's incredibly lightweight. It's just five sheets of plastic covered in metal. And it basically makes an eternal nighttime for the images and also creates a 600 degree difference from the sunshine side to the observation side. There's another image of the mirror. Um, so the mirror, the mirror pieces, they're 18 hexagon pieces. They're made of beryllium. It's very light. It holds its shape, even in extreme cold. And it's got this reflective gold coating. Let me go down. Um, once the telescope is launched, and it's carried by the Ariane rocket, Ariane 5 rocket, um, in partnership with the European Space Agency. And it's going to launch out of, you can see a picture here. It's going to launch out of um, French Guiana. Um, it's going to take 26 minutes for it to um, get into, get up high, and then it'll start to um, have a 30 day journey where it will slowly start to unfold. Um, currently, the all of the pieces had to to be folded almost like a like a rosebud into each other. They keep referring to it as like the origami telescope. Um, the the tripod um, that hold the mirrors are all on hinges. The sun shield has to fold up and um, it fits into a space that is just um, I believe it is just 16 feet wide. So it's really packed in there. 
even though it's over 14,000 pounds. It's just so, so, so tight. Um, and then as it progresses along, it'll slowly start to open. And the first part, one of the first parts that will open will be that sun shield so that the instruments on the other side will continue to get colder and colder and colder before the mirrors kind of unfold and before all the instruments um, get really activated. It's gonna go all the way to an area called um, Lagrange point two. Um, and it's basically, the easiest way to explain it is it's kind of um, the Lagrange areas are these, these sweet spots between two um, objects that two orbital spheres, um, and it's kind of like a, a perfect spot for hovering and balance. However, the Webb telescope isn't going to be just in that Lagrange space, it's actually going to orbit around because it does occasionally on the underside of the sun shield need to get a little bit of light of solar energy from the sun um, so that it continued to have power and fuel itself. Um, I'm gonna scroll back up to the top. Oh. One of the is that um, there were some evolution of instruments that just didn't really exist before. Um, some special infrared spectrometers, some um, fine grain, um, um, sorry, um, fine guidance sensors. Um, it's because it's really looking with infrared um, items. And I lost my picture, but basically, <laughs> Basically, the idea is that um, the Hubble pictures. Sorry about that. Thank you for bearing with me. Um, so then these Hubble pictures, you can see it was really known for like these gas clouds, which are gorgeous and, and definitely inspire a lot of artwork. Um, with infrared, the thought is that, well, what will happen is instead of having light as much light bounce back and, and seeing just these gas clouds, that the infrared will allow us to see inside of these gas clouds, to see what is happening as stars are being formed, and to also see through these gas clouds to, to well beyond, um, to probably, they're talking about, you know, the idea that the universe is ever expanding, that about 14 billion years out would be the first formations of stars and galaxies, and that the Webb telescope will hopefully get views within the first hundred million years. So the, I mean, it's just revolutionary, the thought of thinking about getting glimpses of light coming back from the first stars and galaxies, from the first black holes, um, being able to see exoplanets around um, and other solar systems and see how solar systems work and compare them to our own. There's a lot of predictions um, and a lot of excitement of what could be seen. Um, you know, you might have read or heard on the news about some of the testing that's happened and the, the delay in launch we talked about. And I think it's really interesting to see all the different agencies and all the different stages of the process. There's a, a image right now of the launch window. Um, from, I talked about Ball Aerospace here in, in Colorado, here you go, um, and the formation of the mirrors and how all these pieces and component parts were put together um, across the United States and, and then tested. One of the most interesting things I, I found in my research was images from the Goddard Space Flight Center over here on the East Coast. Um, that was one of the final stages of testing. And every part 
of the telescope had to be tested. This is the centrifuge at Goddard. And so um, big pieces, little pieces were tested with launch forces to make sure that they would um, survive um, just the G-forces of launch. Um, another big part of testing was um, this that you might be able to see. Um, this is the telescope right here, and it's inside a portable clean room. You might have noticed in the pictures everyone wearing like um, protective gear and dust coverings, you know, their shoes are covered, um, so try to keep a dust free zone. And so this is actually a portable clean room, this plastic all around the telescope, and it's being wheeled into a sound chamber. So another test that was done was basically to, to with air pump, roll this in on an air pump, <laughs> float it in, I guess, um, into this enormous chamber that's filled with speakers, like probably the biggest subwoofer <laughs> in the country is in this room. And then to blast it with um, the audio that it might encounter within a launch to see, to make sure nothing shook loose, to make sure it was still functional. Um, Another test was lowering the telescope down onto, this is a big, essentially a big like shaking platform, a big shaking table, if you will, and lowering it down and simulating, um, um, you know, launch vibrations and to make sure that everything is addressed so that it can have a successful launch. Um, so, uh, after Goddard Space Center, after a couple other of the space centers back at California. And then how do you get this enormous three-story high, 14,000 pound telescope to its launch area? And country, um, trucks squeezing onto airplanes. Um, but to get to the launch area, it actually had to be loaded by boat and sent through the Panama Canal because of its weight, even with the efforts to keep it as light as possible. Um, the weight was too much for the bridges from the airport to the launch facility, so it had to go the long way by ship. And then that is where it is now having its final checks. Um, I spoke a bit about the, the 18 hexagonal mirrors, and I, I really kind of focused on that because um, of one of the art celebrations that, that is being run right now. Um, there is this idea of celebrating the James Webb Space Telescope with art that specifically draws inspiration from the telescope itself. Um, if you can see on my screen, there's um, kind of a, a hex, mini hexagons inside of a large hexagon. Um, and this is one uh, challenge, and you can see the hashtag that people are sharing to, to Instagram um, with this art challenge to hashtag JWST art. And so, you know, um, if you're feeling inspired um, and want to keep creating after tonight, this might be something that that rings true to you. I'll turn this on so we can see a couple of the pieces. Hashtag JWST art is encouraging people, as you saw, um, um, visual arts, but um, 
you know, songs and performance art as well, inspired by actual elements of the James Webb Telescope. And then the one that I thought really um, spoke to our work here tonight is another art challenge um, at hashtag unfold the universe. And this is one where it's not so much about what the telescope um, itself, the structure of the telescope itself inspires, but it's a challenge of what might be um, unveiled by the telescope. Um, the unfold the universe is what do you predict might be seen or discovered or viewed out there in the far reaches as we begin to get images of how galaxies grow and evolve and we begin to get images of how stars are born with planets around them and we begin to really see some of those massive black holes and perhaps oldest black holes um, and letting people's imagination, scientific imagination run wild. So if either of those strike an interest for you, um, or you want to share even your work that you're doing tonight, um, I'd encourage you to um, tag the Island Artist Gallery, but also as, as well. And that was a lot of talking, <laughs> um, but I can't wait to see some of your art that transpires tonight. How's it going, Lisa? Hi, yeah, that was wonderful. Thank you so much for, for sharing all that. I, that was pretty amazing. Um, if somebody can turn me back into the host, then I can have two screens going again. So if somebody can get that going. Um, but in the meantime, I did my quick ink sketch on top of my, um, my pencil drawing here. And then I came back and I erased all the scribbly pen pencil stuff that I'd done under it. And I really focused on, um, trying to show the contour of the landscape. Um, oh, I think I can switch here. Let me just see. You should be the host. All right. Let me rearrange slightly. Yes, so I had that really rough pencil sketch that I did, and then I just did ink straight on top of it. And then when I was pretty happy with it, I came back and I erased my pencil scribbliness. So I'm left with just my ink drawing. And I tried to accent and focus on the contour of the landscape that I was seeing on made by all those amazing craters. Um, and tried to just give you a sense of how this landscape is arched and dipping down into a valley and then up and down into another crater. And, and these big black blobs that you're seeing here, that's the shadow cast by the ridges of these craters here. And so we've got a nice high ridge here and then all of this is the shadow cast. So our light is coming from this direction going here. And if you look in the photo that I'm working off of, the, I think it was one of the Hubble photographs. Let me see if I can't share that again super fast. There we go. If you're looking at this photo, you can see that there's a lot more going on in this moon and it is fading off into blackness back here. And so we're gonna try and replicate that. Once again, I'm switching back to my phone again. I'll turn this off so you can see me. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so I'm trying to do the shadows and the highlights here. I'm gonna come in with watercolor now. And I know that was a black and white photo that we're basing this, this piece off of, but I'm just gonna have fun with color because why not? <laughs> Um, and I'm just gonna try and adjust. If anybody wants to show their work in their little screens, that would be great. And we can just kind of share along, I'm trying to see if I can't, I 
have lost that somehow. Um, Yeah, but if anybody wants to hold up their work or if anybody has any questions about my process or any questions about what I might suggest them do on their pieces, feel free. Oh, that's cool. I can see it. Rita, I see yours. Very cool. All right. So I'm going to just go ahead and I don't know if anybody got a color wheel. This is a really basic one. I've had this for a long time. They're really super handy, especially when they've got this nice little shifty thing that helps you see what you want to see and um it, it it's nice with finding complementary colors and and we're going to look at split complementary today so complementary colors are just colors that are on the opposite side of the color wheel when you put them next to each other they make each other look much more vibrant than they were on their own but we're going to do split. So I'm going to do a red orange for some pieces. And then I'm going to do blue and green as, as the contrast there. And I'm just really going to have fun with it. Um, I would suggest if anybody's interested in colors to do their own color wheel as a practice, just by just draw a circle and start blobbing in colors and think about your comp your contrasting colors and and how that relationship is um but i've got my water and this is a really nice little compact um it's actually van gogh brand um travel watercolor case that i got a long time ago but in going through some of the photos that the hubble has come up with there's been some really amazing crazy color combinations out there. And I think that's mostly based off of um, minerals that they found in the ground and accenting those. I'm, I'm probably wrong on that. So correct me if you know the answer there. But they came up with these great colorful pieces where they're just like so amazing to look at. So we're just going to have fun with this and do what we want, where we want, because that's the beauty of art is it is what you want it to be. And there's no way to go wrong with art, I feel like. It's just you have fun. And if you're having fun, then it's going right. So I just mix some orange and red together to get this nice orange red. And this is a gigantic crater over here. And I'm just going to put it in where I see the highlights on that. And um, if you're new to watercolor, then, well, I found it really challenging when I was new to it, but, but it's always been an experiment. So just keep experimenting. That's my biggest suggestion, I suppose, is don't give up, experiment, come back, do some more experiments just play and learn from your play. That's the best way to learn anything, I think. But so I'm just kind of outlining this crater a little bit. It's this gigantic crater that we're seeing up here. And when you're messing with watercolor, you have to add water obviously to these little things to get it to be liquid. But if you want it more concentrated, so that darker color right here is more concentrated than over here, it's just the, um, water pigment ratio that you're working with. So if it's too diluted, add more pigment to it. If it's too intense, add more water to it and just play with it going back and forth. It's great to have a napkin on hand sometimes to just like dab off your paintbrush. And I'm really light with my hand right now. I'm actually like dabbing in a little bit. My paper here is really doing a really good job of absorbing it. And I'm not gonna sweat about going over the lines here on the edges because once this is all dry, I'm actually gonna come back with a black watercolor that's super diluted. And I'm gonna outline all of this in black. So anything out here isn't really gonna show in the end, it's all gonna be black out there. So, so I kind of like that. I'm gonna come back with different colors later on. So I'm gonna do a little bit of orange coming around here and some coming down into this crater too 
And when you're playing with things, you want to think about your composition too. Um, you want things to flow. So I've got a lot of orange going on in here. I want the eye, if composition is having things work together in a sense that it's drawing the person who's viewing it, it's drawing their eye around the piece into different spots of the piece. So if there's a lot going on over here and you're just stuck staring at that spot, then the composition isn't very balanced. And sometimes you have a focal point that you really want them to stare at. And so you want different lines to bring them to that focal point. But in this case, I want their eye to wander around the piece, not just get stuck in one spot. So I'm trying to um, create that. I've created that a bit with my flowing lines on the um, valleys and mountaintops here. But I'm also trying to create that with the fact that this bright orange is all throughout the piece and it kind of flows around the piece. So I'm just going to work on that. Lisa, um, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, could you let Rita get back in? She's in the waiting room. I think oh, that you are the host. So. Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's OK. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> OK, it looks like she's joining now. Thank you for interrupting me. Sorry about that. <laughs> Um, and if anybody has any questions, pipe up and, and shout them out. So don't be shy. And yeah, so we're just working on spreading this around. Where do we want our orange to be? And I'm gonna try and get most of my orange down right now before adding in my blues and my greens because I want the orange to dry mostly before I put in the blues and greens because they'll start to mix on the paper. And sometimes that can kind of muddy things and might not look how you want it to in the end. So, so that's one thing with um, watercolors is they, they like to mix with themselves. Um, there's a lot of different techniques that you can do with watercolor. I'm not the expert on watercolor. I'm much more uh, adapt to um, pen and ink, but I like mixing the two and I've been doing it a little bit more and more. So I'm no expert on watercolor, but there's so many cool techniques that you can do with it as far as like dry brush and dry paper and wet brush and wet paper and really letting the colors and the paint do its thing. There's a lot of cool stuff in there. So if you're interested, just keep exploring and keep researching and, and discover as much as you can. <laughs> and I can even like, with my color, I can dab back on top of where I was to make that a little bit more intense over here too. And sometimes I'm stroking and sometimes I'm actually just touching with the brush and making little like puddles of color here and there. So it's a mixture. I've also, so I'm definitely doing mixed medium here, um, but one fun thing, I can't, I'm not sure exactly where it is at the moment, but I have a jelly roll, here it is from you know high school times when we had all those fun colorful jelly roller pins. This one's white though. And so I have a lot of fun with these at the very end once everything's dry to come back and put in highlights that way, which it can be really fun to do that. Um, but you also, some watercolor sets have white pigment as well. And you can do it that way too. And this is a number 10 round watercolor brush. So it's really handy in the fact that it's wide enough that I can do big washes if I want, but it's also got that nice pointed tip where I can just do like little details as well. Um,
Another thing that's handy with watercolors I've found is having a hairdryer on hand just to speed up the drying process in between your washes if you're impatient, <laughs> which I've been known to be. <laughs> so I've also set them in front of heaters too to get that speed up. One thing I didn't think about this earlier, so I don't, don't have it on hand, but another fun thing when you have like really wet watercolors, it wouldn't quite work with this because I'd needed the pigment to be wetter on the paper, but you could come back and sprinkle salt, just regular table salt or rock salt or whatever salt you have on hand on top of the piece and it will absorb some of the pigment and create this really cool like starburst effect. And so we're probably not going to get all the way done. We won't be done with these pieces by the end of this, but it would be really cool when you're doing your black out background here to throw in a couple pieces of salt and it would replicate almost the effect of like a star in the background there. Be a really fun thing to play around with. So I washed off my brush a bit and I'm gonna go ahead and jump into some greens and start adding some greens in here so we get a little bit of that color combination effect that I was talking about um, in this crater. Again, it's gonna blend with any of that orange if it's wet still. So I'm trying. Sorry, to... Lisa, I think Axel uh, was showing us his piece. Can you do it again, please? Okay. I'm seeing Aaron's piece. That's very great. Wonderful. Yeah, if anybody else wants to share theirs, I think we're getting close to our, our mark here. So I'm gonna try and give you a little bit more instruction on what you can do after the fact. And I would love it if you could share these when you're all done and um, we can explore what everybody was able to create. And be really fun. Oh, there's another one up there. Very cool, I love it. Very fun. Yeah, these are gonna be so fun once once they're all finished. So yeah, you can find the Island Artist Gallery on um, Instagram and on Facebook, and you can just post it on our Facebook or on our Instagram or, um, or tag us or something like that. So we can all see what everybody's created. This is really reminding me of Christmas a little bit here. <laughs> that green and red, the like holly. And while you are uh, working on your art, I have um, left in the chat um, a link where you can join NASA to participate online in the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope. So you want to be uh, on top of any changes or any information of when we are going to finally see the web telescope going into space, I would recommend you to register on, on that web. And then um, I'm also going to leave another link um, from the James Webb Space Telescope, uh, the NASA. Um, countdown site that is very nice and very um, exciting. So I'm leaving those two links there in the chat in case that you want more information or. And, and a little bit before this, I put in the, um, the two websites that Jessica mentioned for sharing your art there. Um, the JWST start or JWST art and un hashtag unfold the universe. So um, please, you know, put your art up there as well. And thank you so much to Jessica and Lisa both for this. Um, I just thought it was fascinating and so, so beautiful. Yeah, thank you so much um, for having 
making this possible. I think Maite, you invited me into this and it's it's been a fun experience. So thank you so much. And I will second that. I really appreciate the invitation. And and I just have to, to share again. Oh, I didn't share this with everybody, but I was at the um, Air and Space Museum in DC not too long ago, and I saw all the advertisements for the the NASA program partnering with libraries. And I thought, oh, mm -hmm. that'd be so perfect for us. And then um, and then I got back and Maite reached out and I was like, oh, of course, of course she is doing this. And and it's really amazing. I believe we're one of, is it 60 libraries in the country? Yes. Maite? Yeah, yes. 60. We were, yeah, we were very lucky. So we are, we, we, in fact, in Alaska, there are two libraries, Kenai and Sitka. So we are very, very lucky. And I really appreciate both um, your um, presentation and Lisa's class. Um, yeah, I think any way that we can to bring uh, this type of programming to our community is fantastic. So if any of you have any idea of what you would like to see or experiment, um, please let me know. Uh, now that we have this year of grants, uh, the grant uh, with NASA, I will do all I can to provide any programming that you would like to see. Um, I want to also thank Pat and the Island Artist Gallery for opening their doors to this, uh, this program. I know that they are doing this series of, of talks combining art and the natural world um, around us. So I think this program fits right into, you know, instead of looking around, we are looking up, but um, it's our natural world. So thank you, Pat, very much. Thank you, everybody. Oh. Our pleasure, and I, I really hope we'll be able to do more of these um, collaborations. I just think having the, the combination and the art and the science is so fabulous. And um, I don't know if anybody had a chance to look up at the sky two nights ago, I guess, but when there was an alignment of the planets with the moon, it was uh, amazing. And I, you know, so there just is so much there to see. Yeah, thank you all. I missed that alignment, Pat, but I have been seeing the moon. It's been really clear skies at night recently, and it's been beautiful. Even saw some shooting stars the other night. It's gorgeous. I did see, just so everybody's aware, that our Aurora forecast, I think it's I think it's either tomorrow or Saturday night is fairly high. I want to say it was a, a five rating. So if it's clear, stay up and, and go outside and look around. You never know. And one more thing, uh, we have a community member who has donated a telescope to the library. Um, it's not a new one, but we are gonna uh, provide the telescope to the public. So stay tuned. If you want to check out a telescope, wow. you will be able to do that. Like I said, it's not a very new uh, device, but I think it's still uh, working. So I'm excited about that. Yeah, that's very exciting. Mm -hmm. Oh, and the other thing, we will have this talk, um, we'll edit it a little bit, and then we'll have this talk up on YouTube. And so I will put a, a notice out when that's ready to go. It'll probably be maybe two weeks, a week or two anyway. Um, so you can check back in and be able to see all this information and Lisa's gorgeous artwork on YouTube um, soon. All right, does anyone want to share uh, uh, where you are at with your work right now before we uh, say goodbye? <laughs> Um, uh, I think this is a question Alexandra is asking for more information about the telescope. I cannot answer what type oh. of a scope it is, but I will tomorrow. Uh, I will email you from the library, Alexandra. Whoa. Wow, that's super cool. 
Nice. Very nice. Very nice. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> oh, I love it. Fun. And I also, this is Pat, I want to just apologize for the technical glitches. Um, normally, we have someone at the Island Artist Gallery that helps with the the Zoom recordings and and she's out of town on vacation right now. So I'm no, I'm terrible at it, but but we try and we get through it. So um, <laughs> thank you all for your patience and and thank you so much, Maite, for getting this going. It's yeah, it, it, it was a pleasure and you did an amazing job. So thanks. Um, if anybody uh, wants to also send a, a a screenshot of the art to the to my email at the library. We will also be posting it online. So any uh, whatever comfort zone you are in, if you want to share what you're doing, perfect. If not, that's okay too. So thank you. Yeah, I just want to say thank you again and let everybody know that all artists started out as amateurs. So just keep working at it and keep exploring and and don't ever stop being curious. <laughs> um, and if you have any questions, just please feel free to reach out. It's the best way to learn is to ask. So. I suppose we're coming to an end here. We have hit our mark, but I'll, I'll be sharing the end results of this once I've, I've come to a finish here. And, and again, just so everybody knows, I am going to be filling all this edge work in with black and I might try that salt technique just to see what happens there. So, so just keep exploring and have fun with your work. That's the best thing to do is just Remember to have fun. <laughs> and someone asked if is there a way to tag the library on Instagram too? I'm sure there is. Maybe yes, that's something yeah. you can put in the chat. I am I am looking for <laughs> I am so I, you know we have two different Instagrams. One one is for teams and the other is for just the library. But it would be nice to have it at the libraries. So I'm looking for it because I control the youth part, but not the, the adults one. So one second. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Mm. Well. Let's see. Well, it's sick of public library altogether. Lisa, that is a spectacular. How Thanks. how are you gonna use the, the white um what, how do you call the white uh, yeah that yeah. Well, I yeah. have to wait for it to dry, but I'm going to, uh -huh. I'll bring it around and I'll just do like little hash marks, just like I did uh -huh. with black ink, but it's white ink. So I'll just do highlights that way. So okay. the ridges pop out a little bit more that way. Perfect. Yeah. Nice. And once, once this is all black, I might put in some stars as well. And yeah. Right. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, once this is all black, this will stand out a lot more and it'll look, look a lot different that way with that contrast. The contrast is really what mm. makes things pop usually. So, and then before anybody else goes, just so you know, sometimes I will paint actual ink straight down on. So I've got this thing of just ink that you can dip your ink 
quill pens into. Oh. But yeah, sometimes I just dip my paintbrush in it and then start playing Whoa. with it and just go right up to your piece. And sometimes it takes a couple layers of it for me to be happy, but because <laughs> they'll soak in and it won't be oh, quite wow. as black as I want it to be, so. That's so amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. It me goosebumps. Yeah, mm. it's really gonna make it pop that way, so. Yeah. And like in this area here where it's got some intricate craters, it'll look really fun. Oh, let's see, then Oops. you have to always <laughs> Too remember. Soon. Yeah. That's why we have napkins on hand too. I'll let that dry. <laughs> and you but sometimes be... it's nice to have it blend just a little bit mm -hmm. into the. Yeah, especially up here, like it would be good to have that blend a little bit. What was that, Maite? You will be using the salt at the very end for the salt. The salt. Yeah. yeah, so I could throw salt down in this area right now and it would start to do that effect. Um, mm. But I don't want it to be scattered with stars. I, I'm thinking just like just a couple here or there. So yes, mm -hmm. yeah, so I'm going to wait to do the rest of this um, till I get my salt out. But mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's just a matter of blending and adding and letting it dry and blending some more and And just playing around with it, learning your medium. That's, that's and I'm still learning. <laughs> but we're always still learning. Yeah, and that's the best thing about art, life, whatever you're interested in. It's usually so so dynamic in so many different ways that there's always something new to explore mm. and discover. So, and one thing that I love about this particular photo is you know this moon is. It's like all the way out there at oh. least. And, uh -huh. and that's all in the shadow. And so it's mysterious, but only part of it's popping out at us. But yeah. So yeah, when I'm done with this, I will definitely share share the final piece. Okay. I would love to see it. Well, I'm loving it right now. It really is just, oh, I love to see your work too. It's Thank fascinating. You. So yeah, but I would love to see the the the, the product for sure at the end. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. Mm. Yeah, and if anybody else, again, if you want to share any of your pieces, Pat added those links and then also hashtagging the island artists and mm -hmm. just posting straight onto our Facebook and onto the the library's Facebook. I'm sorry, I keep trying to say museum. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> but yeah. All right. Okay, well, uh, thank you again, everybody. I think uh, this is a, a great moment to uh, to wrap the whole program. Um, and then uh, we will keep uh, staying connected through the art and the space and the social media. Sounds All wonderful. Right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody.